Hey, my beautiful people. Welcome back to the Green Cards to Greenback show. My name is Nestor Vargas and I am your host. Thank you so much for listening. If you're new to the show, this is a show where financially successful first-generation immigrants reveal the steps they took to avoid low-paying jobs, build generational wealth, and attain the American dreams. Additionally, we discuss investing and retirement planning topics. Today's episode is a story about Horacio Peña, and I'm really excited to tell you that story because there's an amazing amount of wisdom that you're going to get from this. Horacio Peña's story is really begins as a teenager who got on a bus from his native country of Mexico to the U.S. with only $200 in his pocket. And he's now the youngest partner ever at Pricewater Cooper House, one of the world's leading consulting and accounting firms. So in this episode, he's going to give us many valuable lessons that we can immediately implement to accomplish our goals and really catapult our success. But really, before we get to hear from him, let me tell you a little bit more about a few of his accomplishments. And when I say just a few is because if I were to tell you all of them, the whole entire episode would be all about it. But, uh, you know, he's very humble about his accomplishments and uh, just a, an amazing person to hear from. So let me tell you about his accomplishments here. A triple major in economics, political science and history from Sonny at Stony Brook. He did that in only three years. Guys, it took me five years just to do a regular degree. Uh, so if you're feeling down on yourselves, it's OK. I'm with you. I feel your pain. But, uh, you know, the story of him immigrating and getting to this college is really interesting. And so you're going to get to hear about how he did that. Once he got that undergrad, he then actually ended up going off to grad school at Yale. That's right, Yale, where he obtained a degree in international economics and finance. And so that transfer or that journey from undergrad to grad is also really interesting. He did that in a very abnormal way. And I think it's something that we can learn from. Well, I don't think, I know for a fact, we're going to learn a lot from that. So now he's an internationally renowned transfer pricing expert. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. He's also a, a top economic advisor to some of the world's largest and fasting growing multinational companies. He is a tax principal and senior economist based in New York City, the headquarter of Pricewater Cooper. Before we actually dive into hearing his college story and hearing his current work, I want to take us back a little bit and I want you to hear a little bit more about what was going on when he was a teenager in Mexico. So let's go ahead and get started and listen to it. I was a kid uh, living in Mexico, studying, but ever since I was a little kid, I was interested in transactions in business. Back then, Mexico was full of import substitution. There was not a trade. So I used to go to the black market and buy products that you could buy in the United States and sell it in my school. I used to be robbed sometimes, and it was uh, sometimes uh, it was difficult. And I remember some of my friends were crying when we got beat up once. And it was like, well, sometimes we have to diversify our risks. But no, one day there was a huge financial crisis. I was a kid. The government nationalized all the banks in Mexico. Inflation went up to 100%. It was total chaos. And I remember as a young kid, I was felt totally lost and upset and sad. I didn't understand what was going on. And that was a day that was I got really interested in economics. And I said, I, I want to be an economist. And at the time, uh, my family was immigrated to the United States. And I was doing my military service. So I had to stay behind and I had to cross the border in a bus because I didn't have my cartilla militar uh, but I did have my visa to the United States, so I was good. I crossed the Rio Grande. I was in the bus with my, I sold every every possession I had, and I had my $200 in my pocket and taking the bus to Houston. I did apply to colleges in the United States, and I remember when I applied to college, it was such a daunting task. There was no internet back then. There were no manuals on how to apply to college. My English was pretty poor. I took the TOEFL exam, and it was I got pretty lousy scores. But the first lesson I think for me is don't believe everything you hear and don't be afraid to challenge the rules that sometimes been made to exclude you. And so what I decided to do is I apply it to a bunch of colleges. And I remember I tried to take the SAT test. It was so difficult. I had I was terrible at taking standardized tests. <laughs> I've never taken standardized tests in my life. And I remember as a kid, I made the executive decision. I said, you know what? 
I'm going to apply to all these colleges and I'm not going to take the SAT. You know what? I'm just going to skip the SAT. Hmm. And guess what? True story, Nestor, I got accepted to every single college I applied. At this point in the story, I decided to ask Horacio what the black market was. I was really intrigued about this black market that he talked about. And not only did I get an explanation of what the black market was, but I got a history lesson that I think is very valuable for us to understand and really better understand how the world used to work just 30 years ago. Many countries in Latin America, in the old days of import substitution, you were not allowed to bring in goods from America, from the United States. When I grew up, there was only one pair of sneakers, one pair of jeans. They were not all the goods and services we have enjoyed today. So if somebody wanted to buy an American chocolate or an American Nike sneakers were really important, you actually had to go to a market that was illegal, that they would import sneakers and all the kinds of things in the United States, and you had to buy them and resell them. So now right now with globalization, we take for granted that we have access to everything, but it was not always that way. Markets were very restrictive in the past. So at this point, we get a little bit of a better understanding of where Horacio was coming from, what was going on in his teenager days, and what was really motivating him. But I still was wondering what led him to take this huge risk of leaving everything behind in the country where he was born to come to the United States and figure a new future out. Go ahead and listen closely as he tells us a little bit more about what the catalyst was, what he was looking for, and what was motivating him. I mean, I was so eager and hungry and ambitious to learn, to understand, uh, particularly, you know, all the economic problems of Mexico. I wanted to understand why Mexico was suffering so much from the economic crises and why international things were so important. And in Mexico, when I tried to study economics, basically there were just two ways. Either you would study Marxist economics in Mexico and then at the National University of Mexico, or you started like right-wing neoclassical economics. There was no nothing in between. So for me to come to the United States and have access to a liberal arts education and to be able to choose your courses and study anything you want, it was just a dream come true. Amazing. What is the difference between Marxist economics and then the other types of economics you talked about? Well, you know, the Marxist economics, Marx would basically say that the means of production, the factories, the goods, the agriculture should be controlled by the state, basically, mm -hmm. the government. And, you know, they push for communism, basically. And as we all know, there were many countries who pursued communism, like the Soviet Union, Russia, China. But many of those experiments collapsed. Many of those systems ended up in totalitarian systems, meaning dictators exploiting things and reducing, curtailing the liberties of citizens. I think to have liberty to think what you want to think, to write what you want to write, to get any job you want to go, to go to, to, go to a different state is very important. Right? We cannot give that for granted today. Even in China, for example, they live what I call a kind of like a Stalinist digital state where the government today controls with apps where you move, how you move. If you get COVID, you, they send you to a special hotel, a certain place. God forbid your son gets COVID, they'll take your son away from you. They won't ask your permission. So this is the real, real world. Every citizen in China has a credit rating. The government monitors you all the time. I think having liberty of movement and speech and, and will is, is something extraordinarily valuable and we cannot take for granted because in many countries, they don't have that. At this point in Horacio's journey, he's a sunny in Stony Brook, triple majoring, and he was doing this really quickly. I mean, he did this in three years. You know, in the back of my mind, I'm wanting to know how, right? How was he able to triple major in three years coming from a Spanish-speaking country? How did he do it? And so I got really curious and decided to ask him what the trick was. What was the magic sauce? Having a vision of what you want to achieve is so important, so motivating. And of course, I'm extraordinarily grateful to my parents and my family, because you said it as well. I mean, we're a product of who surrounds us, right? And so our family and friends are truly inspirational, and you gain confidence on things you can achieve. But you have to take some risks. And, and I remember coming in and saying, oh, I had to take all these prerequisites and everything else. 
And I had to take some risks and say, you know what, I'm going to skip all those prerequisites and I'm just going to go enroll to the intermediate courses or the advanced courses. And if I fail, that's okay. I'll take them again or whatever. I was really struggling with calculus. My math skills were terrible. My English were bad. So I took calculus for pass fail and then I took it for the second time. And in my school, you needed a C plus as a minimum grade to get your economics degree. And guess what? I got a C plus on calculus, <laughs> barely made it. But the whole idea is that to me, all of us, we just got to roll with the punches. You can't let a little mini failure get you down. You got to get up and keep getting up and take the blows. And that's how I try to do it. I love it. And it shows that all this prereq classes, yeah, I don't know how much value we all get from that. You know, there's this book called The 80-20 Principle by uh, Richard Karch, right? And he says that 20% of the activities that you do actually create 80% of the results. Wow. And, you know, here we are, right? You, you skipped all his prereq classes. You took the classes that really mattered. And then you were able to move forward with your vision. By now, we know how Horacio got to undergrad, what he was doing in undergrad, but at some point in time in that journey in undergrad, he decided that he wanted to actually go to an Ivy League school. He wanted to study with the brightest minds in economics, but it was told by many people that his grades were not good enough, that his English was terrible, and to just not even waste his time applying to go to you know, an Ivy League school. So this is where Horacio really starts looking at his strengths, not his weaknesses, to really figure out a way to actually get to Yale. What we're about to listen to is really, I think, educative and, and very amazing because we're able to actually see how he's thinking outside the box and how he is able to start taking action then to be prepared for this transition that he wants to make to go to Yale. It's really amazing what he does here. So we'll go ahead and listen in. Well, I'm going to have to do something extraordinarily different if I want to make my dream come true. And so therefore, I realized that a lot of my peer students didn't like to do research, they didn't like to write a lot and investigate a lot. And there were actually few students in my class who did that. So I, I decided to do an auto thesis in economics and political science and in, enroll in independent study. And that what that allowed me to do is, is to develop a very strong relationships with my professors and mentors. I took some graduate courses in my university. And so I got a tremendous letters of recommendations from the college. And so that all that basically allowed me to get accepted to, to Yale University to study international economics and finance. That's amazing. So play to your strengths, not your weaknesses. It seemed to me that you love to do research, you love to learn, and a lot of other students didn't. You had this vision of knowing that you wanted to study with the brightest minds out there. You were already thinking about what steps you needed to take to be able to get to that future self-state in undergrad school. Great way to think about life and uh, how important it is to really have that clarity of where you're headed, right? Because had you not had that vision, the environment around you, so the other students, you would have kind of been stuck doing what they were doing and, and maybe not getting to that next level. Interesting. So we, we get to Yale. Tell me a little bit more about what do you what do you remember? So all of a sudden, I remember that I was the most ignorant, less prepared person in my class. Everybody from all over the world, from India, from China, from Germany, from the UK, everybody spoke better. They had much more advanced mathematical skills than I did. And I did suffer a little bit, to tell you the truth, Nestor, feeling the least prepared student in the class. If you fail one course, you get expelled. I remember getting a super low grade in advanced microeconomics, and the professor called me in and said, you know, if you fail, uh, you failed the midterm, so you need to get a 96 in the final in order to pass. Incredibly, I got the 96 in the final, so I survived the course. And at the end of the day, the professor said, I'm, you're the only student in my entire career I've seen to pull the curve on both sides, on the low end and the high end in the same semester. <laughs> but uh, I think the lesson there for me is that, again, I had to outwork people. I had to work double and triple. I remember going to the law school at Yale, and I was shocked. I, had, I was told that I have to read 500 pages a week of all these court cases. And it was I started reading the first one, and I was such a slow reader. It was impossible for me to read it. 
And again, the same thing as like, I, I don't even understand this technical word petitioner and this and that technical words I was not familiar with. I made the decision not to read a single court case in class. I went, took the class. I sat in front of the professor with a red pen, a green pen, a blue pen. I asked a million questions and I, I developed a very strong memory to remember what the teacher was asking. And uh, I took the courses and I did very well on the, on the law courses that I took from Yale University. And I didn't read a court case because it was just, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do that and study econometrics and study uh, those law courses at the same time, just didn't have enough time. So I had to lean on other skills um, that I had to try to capture the information, understand it and, and pass the tests. Oh man, that is mind blowing. You finish your degree. What, what was your degree in? I did my own major. So I, I was in the Yale Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I took a bunch of PhD courses in economics and a number of corporate finance courses in the business school and a number of, of law courses in the law schools. Uh, so I was very interested in developing my own concentration around markets, economics, and regulations. So our friend Horacio graduates Yale, and unfortunately, he graduates during a recession. And so he gets a job that he hates, actually trading commodities. So he decides to quit the job and becomes a waiter. Yes, you heard me right, a waiter for seven years. He loved it. He became really good friends with the cooks. And he actually just really enjoyed how to deal with people in that job. But uh, that was around 1990. This is where he actually tells us where he had a really pivotal point in his life that catapulted him to his actual career. So let's go ahead and listen in and learn a little bit more about what happened in the 1990s that was so important for him. Two very important things is in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. In 1990, I graduated and it was a recession. But 1990 was a huge year. That was the year where the third industrial revolution started, the services revolution. What does that mean? Sure. Well, the internet came out, came online in 1990. And Windows 1.0 came out on that year as well. And I was job searching, job searching, job searching, and finally got a job to go to Washington, D.C. to work as an economist for a big consulting firm. And I went there. And I started focusing on innovation. And again, the internet was just starting. I became almost became a Microsoft technician because I learned Excel and Microsoft Word and all the Microsoft products. And I started using data for the first time, using large data sets to do analyses and drop data in text form to electronic form. And I worked with, uh, with a number of international agencies, the World Bank and other organizations there to privatize industries in Estonia, Lithuania, Slovenia, and some other countries. And again, I felt I was the dumbest guy in the room because I felt like I was surrounded by 100 chiefs and three Indians, and I was the Indian, and everybody was ordering me around. Uh, I didn't know anything, again, in terms of terminology or database or Microsoft or anything. It was a very difficult period of my life being in Washington, D.C. by myself and, and working and, and trying to learn all these things. But it was an investment. It was an investment that later paid off. Mm. Help our audience understand what privatization of industries is. Yeah, so I was saying that in 1980, you know, in the old days, there was, uh, there was a Soviet Union and there was all these governments that controlled all the industries. So that the Soviet Union collapsed because it was broke. And so as a result, all these republics in Eastern Europe became independent. And a privatization means when the industries go back to market, to the market. So in other words, if there was a telecommunications company or the electricity company that was controlled by the state, they would sell it back to the open market. And what we did is we broke down the value of the companies into shares and we distribute those shares to all the citizens in the countries. So every citizen in these countries owned a share of these public works companies. There, you know, there was restrictions. They couldn't sell shares immediately, but they could sell them down the road. And as a result, all that wealth that went from the industry was distributed to the citizens. And to this day, if you go to those economies, you will see that the markets operate very well. So as we see, Horacio was really having tons of success, but he wanted to actually be able to use his Mexican roots for something. 
At that time, around 1993, there was a trade pact going on called NAFTA. And so he sees this coming, he sees this developing, and he decides to become an expert in that trade agreement. So he moves to New York to start a consulting group and does phenomenal. He just takes off, starts consulting, you know, goes down to Mexico, starts selling contracts to these companies so he can really tell them what to do for this trade agreement. How are they going to bring their goods from Mexico to the U.S.? How are they going to deal with taxes? How are they going to deal with regulations? Well, later, he had so much success that his firm merged, and he was sent all around the world to help companies do business, which was really amazing. So he had tremendous success in this period, and I decided to ask him about his process. I decided to kind of dig deeper and, and ask him to tell us a little bit more about the way he thinks and how does he actually, you know, use all of his information to be successful. I guess I would say I probably went through three or four phases in my career, right? My first phase is I wanted to be a subject matter expert. I really wanted to be the best advisor technically possible. I read everything. I studied everything, every court case, every decision, every analysis. And it was a lot of work, repetition, repetition, repetition to master your trait. And I really believe that you got to master it before you can actually innovate and make it even better. So I had a phase where I said, I want to be the best advisor possible. And I went through several years. At some point, I said, you know what? I don't want to be the best anymore. I want to be the highest revenue producing partner. And I, I want to be able to generate as much revenue as possible, have more leverage, bigger teams, be able to run bigger projects. And then I did achieve that. And I did that for 15 years continuously. And then at some point, I say, you know what, now I want to go into a third phase. Now I want, I don't want to be continue to be the highest revenue producing partner forever. Now I want to innovate and I want to disrupt my own practice by applying some of these emerging technologies so we can transform the way we do things. And at that point, I was offered a very interesting job as being the innovation and digitization leader of my firm. So I had that role for three years where we used this innovation activities as part of the fourth industrial revolution to try to transform our business. Thank you for sharing that. I, I got to ask a follow-up question because what I'm trying to really teach the audience is that you have to think about where you're headed in a very creative way or else you're going to get stuck. There's a saying that 2 xing something that you're doing is a lot harder than 10 xing something that you're doing. Yes. And that is because 2 xing something, you just have to work harder and longer. But 10 xing you have to think completely different about your process. You have to break it down and you have to think about outside the box. You really do. How did you do that? What were the motivators? What is the process to do that? Yeah, I don't think you, Nestor. I, I really think that, by the way, in the old days of the Middle Ages, when, when nothing happened, you could continue to operate in one way for all your life, right? When my grandfather became an engineer, well, fine, he could be an engineer for the rest of his life. That was fine. I think that the reality, Nestor, is that nowadays in the fourth industrial revolution, we're all going to have to reinvent ourselves constantly, continuously. We're going to be infinite learners. And to so me, that there's a number of steps that we need to take. And number one is we really got to declutter and simplify our lives. And we really need to identify what's holding us back. Because if you're constantly overwhelmed, like I said, going back to the parade, then you can't, you don't have the bandwidth to look at the panorama, to look at the big pictures, see what's going to change. I have something that I call my SID theory, C-I-D, consumption, investment, distractions. And that is, a lot of people think that they're investing in themselves, but they're actually just having fun. <laughs> and so that's more of a consumption activity. And then more nowadays, there's just so many distractions, whether social media, whether you're focusing on something else, people are asking you favors. And so the more you focus on distractions, then the less you have to really invest in what's going to make you successful and unique in the future. And also affects your happiness, because if consumption is about really being happy with your friends, with your family, achieving fulfillment. And if you're constantly being distracted and you're always busy, 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 so you can't really talk to your friends and your, and your family, you're not going to be ultimately happy. So I think uh, step number one is declare your life. Number two is really be conscious about what's distracting you. You know, in the Greek philosophy, the most important 
concept is know yourself. And you really have to know yourself and be brutally honest with yourself. Not what your parents told you or, or the church told you or anybody told you. is like you have to really say what's going to make you happy. And then comes imagination to start imagining that you may not like your job. I didn't like my job. My entry, I, I think entry-level jobs in general are really difficult, really difficult. And sometimes a lot of people change jobs because they hate their job. But I think you have to have use imagination and see, well, how can this job evolve over the next three to five years? And how can it evolve beyond that? And what kind of skills I can take from these? Like when I was uh, in the World Trade Center, right? It turns out that that, that that center was fully automated, dismantled. There are no humans working in that commodities exchange anymore. But you have to think about what kind of skills you can take with you to apply somewhere. And then you talk a lot about this is once you figure that out, you got to talk to others. You got to you get a mentor and coach to develop that purpose of vision, that vision that you have. And once you have that vision, then you focus on on formulating and executing the plan. And then the question is, how do you keep it up? Because it's not easy. It's hard work. And I think that's where the next step comes in. And that is developing high performing habits. I think habits are really important. We, are, we human beings are animals of habit. And I think developing a habit, uh, like for me, was, okay, we got to wake up. Uh, my father was in the Army. So when I was a kid, you know, he would wake us up early and do certain things. So I, I got it firsthand. I, I benefited a lot by that. So even today, I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I, I read the papers every day, and I do certain key things. But the nice thing about it is once you develop that habit, then it's easy to sustain. If you don't develop a habit and you change your routine all the time, then it's going to be a little more difficult. And then the reality, once you have there, the rest of it is grit. It's all about grit. And, I mean, there's a great book that I I would like to recommend everybody. It's called Grit, The Power, Passion, and Perseverance by Angela Duckworth. I think that she would say that, Grit is a much far more explanatory power than success, than intellect or discipline or emotional intelligence or IQ or training or, or anything else. It's like at the end of the day, I think one of the stories in the book says that that uh, West Point, they were wondering why their cadets uh, were dropping out and why they were not graduating with the way they wanted everything else and did a huge analysis and concluded that it was not the smartest ones, it was not the super athletes, it was not the the other types of attributes they would expect that that would drive success. But it was the cadets who said, I'd rather die than to drop out. The cadets that said, I'd rather drown, I'd rather you break my bones before I quit. The cadets who were were the most uh, focused on success, who wanted it. The reality is a lot of people don't want to pay the price. The people who wanted to pay the price what was the single most uh, important factor explaining success. So once you have your plan, then you got to apply grit. And then finally, the last step is you got to stay open to future change and the next reinvention. Because like I said, I think the world, one thing's for sure, it's going to be massive change going forward. So you got to be willing to go on through the next, like this pandemic, to go through the next transition. Who knows what the next curveball is going to come? And we got to be ready to pivot and to reinvent ourselves all over again. Alrighty, my friends, thank you so much for listening to this amazing story. Thank you so much for your support with the podcast. Remember to actually visit greencards2greenbacks.com where you'll find show notes and links to any resource that Horacio has mentioned and other resources that I'll be sharing with you. Remember to tell your friends about this podcast if you're enjoying it. Remember to subscribe to it as well in whatever platform you're using. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and let's go make those greenbacks. Greenbacks.